Hello everyone, uh, thank you guys all for coming out. We're about to get started here, so uh, be sure to swing by the bar and grab some oh, yeah. last minute snacks, and yeah, we'll get started here pretty soon. Well, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Ryan Thayer. I'm the Executive Director here at the Farm Air Museum, and we really do appreciate all your support and you coming out and supporting us here at the Air Museum. Um, tonight is our Cold War uh, History Night, uh, talking about the role North Dakota played during the Cold War, and it uh, should be really fun and very interesting evening. But first, I'd like to uh, get into a couple updates here at the Air Museum. Uh, our mission is to promote aviation through restoration, preservation, and education. So we have a lot of great new programs. Um, we have an amazing staff here. We have an amazing board of directors to help support us. Uh, we have some honorary board members here in the audience. Would you guys mind raising your hands? Thank you so much for all your support. So with education, we're, we're very, very excited to announce our newest education program. It's called the Little Flyers Club. And uh, our education coordinator, Karina, has really put a lot of work and effort into this. And uh, we are taking our advanced education camps on the road. So kids can come here to the museum. We have three camps a month. The kids can learn about STEM topics, STEAM topics, learn about careers in aviation, uh, learn about robotics, programming, avionics, a lot of really awesome, amazing, advanced topics. Uh, but we've decided that we need to share that with more of the community here around Fargo Memorial. So we've launched our Little Flyers Club where we go to schools like Kindred, Harwood Elementary, uh, Maple Valley, Detroit Lakes, and we bring our camps to those elementary schools to share our camps with those local schools. Uh, we've also partnered with the uh, Experimental Aircraft Association where they do a monthly camp here at the museum where kids get to build a real, live, full-scale aircraft. It's a wooden aircraft, a people aircraft, uh, which is very, very exciting, where these kids get to actually build jigs, build wing ribs all out of wood, and we're going to build a full-size actual aircraft. Now, it won't be airworthy, but um, nonetheless, very, very cool. Uh, with preservation, we really want to focus on supporting our veterans. How many veterans do we have in the room today? Thank you so much for your service. We really appreciate that your service and everything you've given for our country. So we want to uh, help honor and support you through our uh, second Wednesday of the month. We do our Veterans Coffee Hour here at the museum, where we provide free donuts and free coffee. So if you are a veteran or no veteran, please come check it out. Uh, we have a lot of fun. And we also celebrate our military birthdays here at the museum too. So when the Air Force has an anniversary, we do a celebration, special exhibits. It's a lot of fun as well. And then lastly, our restoration school or uh, leg of our school is really focused on restoring and uh, preserving our history. So we do have uh, two aircraft in our hangar that we are restoring, our BT-13, as well as our Stinson Gullwing. So again, we want to uh, promote mediation through those three facets, education, preservation, and restoration. And again, we can't do this without uh, you guys' support and coming out and attending our events. So again, thank you so much for uh, coming out tonight. I would like to introduce uh, Max Saban. He is our collections manager here at the Farm Bear Museum. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys all for coming out. Um, like Brian said, my name is Max Saban and I'm the collection manager here. I've been at the Fargo Air Museum now for coming on two years. Um, I know we're all here to hear some amazing stories and you know talk about the Cold War here on the prairie. So before I begin, um, after the show, if you guys wouldn't mind, we have a brand new exhibit that's opening that coincides with this incredible uh, presentation called Cold War on the Prairie. Um, be sure to check it out if you guys haven't already, but without further ado, um, we'll get started. So, um, I kind of introduced myself already, but as you can see, we have some three amazing guests, so I will pass it off to them to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their backgrounds and, you know, why they're up here. So, let's get started. Age before beauty, you will. <laughs> Try. Um, Since he got up, I guess I'll stand up. Uh, my name is Jason Patrick. Uh, I am the wing historian for the 319 reconnaissance wing out of Grand Forks Air Force Base. Um, obviously, we had a, a big involvement in the Cold War out here, and uh, obviously, we had the strategic missile wing uh, out there as well. Uh, so, yeah, I. Uh, I'm a little bit of a fish out of water, if you will. I am a dumb old army mule who now works for the Air Force. 
former maintenance warrant officer in the Army for 11 years. Uh, did time at 10th Mountain Division and a few other places. So, uh, all expenses paid vacations to dry, sandy places where no one likes you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of me. Just a uh, history, study history at, uh, at Columbia uh, College. They had a satellite campus down in Wonderwood, my last duty station. And, yeah, now I'm here, so this should be fun. And take over there. Hey everyone, my name is Will Cromerty, uh, former CIA officer and current director of business development at Aerial Robotics. Uh, you know, a lot of my time um, in the agency was spent focused on Russian counterproliferation operations. So, uh, learning about Russian capabilities, uh, their attempts to steal our capabilities, um, having some fun messing with their programs and ruining their day. And so, uh, over time, you know, I, I kind of ended up with a, a personal interest in the Cold War, ended up becoming a collector, and uh, started talking to Max and brought him a literal pickup truck load of artifacts back there. So, uh, looking forward to talking to him. I really am the fish out of water. We have two content experts up here and a former missile launch control officer from Grand Forks Air Base. Now, a little bit of bio on me, I guess, is I'm a farm boy from Wing, North Dakota that went to NDSU for an ag degree, went through ROTC, and ended up uh, being a nuclear weapons officer for the Air Force for four years. So that's what I did. Uh, I was a missile air, a silo jockey, down below uh, the soil of North Dakota, about 60 feet down, and uh, had a lot of experiences, uh, some good, some not so good, and uh, so that's what I did. I spent four years doing that, and then left the service, uh, went into private industry, then went back to government, and last year I retired from the USDA. And so, uh, lately, We've been spending the summers at our lake house on Pelican Lake over here in Minnesota and running and spending our winters in Bismarck. And, uh, all four, all three of our children are NDC grads and my wife and I are, so we spend a lot of time here uh, watching Bison football. Awesome. All right, let's get started. So this one is up first for Jason. Um, so when did Grand Forks Air Force Base open? Well, before I answer that, Max, uh, you, you did not tell me that there was going to be a spook here. <laughs> so, sorry. I, I couldn't resist. I have a horrible habit of reaching for low hanging fruit when it comes to humor. So, bear with me and please forgive me. Uh, okay, so fire away again. Sorry. Distracted myself. No worries. Um, so, the first question is uh, when did Grand Forks Ace, uh, Air Force Base open? So, Grand Forks Air Force Base became operational in, in, in 1957, um, and, and, and that's obviously a significant date for the base, but kind of what I think may be a little bit more significant is if we turn the clock back a little bit to 1954, uh, Department of Defense and the Air Force looking to put uh, new bases up in the northern tier area to be able to, you know, do intercept missions uh, and, and things like that, and Grand Forks was on the list of locations. And the amazing part about this, though, is that the, the city of Grand Forks actually raised the money and paid for the 5,400 acres that Grand Forks Air Force Base occupied. Uh, it, was, it was that big of an influence to have it there, uh, that, that the community wanted it there so much that they, uh, they paid for it. <laughs> Effectively, they paid for the land. Um, I think, uh, I think the rubbing operation on the runway started uh, in 55, 56. Uh, it became active in 57. Uh, and we've got a gentleman that I was talking to out in the audience who was with the uh, 41st, 33rd, right back there. So that was, a, that was the first unit, one of the first units to stand up at Grand Forks, uh, along with the 18th uh, Fighter Interceptor Squadron uh, flying F-101 Fudos. So uh, that's, that's kind of when Grand Force started as far as the Air Force Base. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, that's a perfect segue into our next question. Um, what were the first aircraft assigned to Grand Forks Air Force Base and when? And then what were the first missiles? Okay, so we already mentioned the F-101 Voodoos. Uh, and that, I think those aircraft got there 57, 58. It, it wasn't right away. It came a little bit later. Uh, then you had the KC-135s coming in to support that in 63, if 
I remember correctly, is when the B-52s showed up, uh, and then the uh, ICBMs uh, came in in 64. 64? Well, the unit was established in 64, they became operational in 66. Yeah, they started standing up. They were, they were loading missiles and silos and everything, and doing all that by 65, 66. So. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, B-52s were, uh, were there from 63 until 86, 87. Um, we swapped out for the, uh, the B-1, the bone. Um, and then uh, there's upgraded KC-135Rs uh, in, in that time frame. We also, 321st, switched from the LGM-30 Fox to the Gulf, right? That was, what, 70, I think? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are you talking about from Minuteman 2 to Minuteman 3? Yes. Okay. That yeah. was in uh, uh, 73. 73 that happened. Okay. That's a, that's a primary source right there. So, uh, you know, he's probably going to know firsthand more than I do from, you know, flipping through old dusty pages uh, and, and whatnot. Um, so, we had the bones uh, up until 94. Uh, the uh, the last missile silo, I think, was imploded in 2002, but I believe all of the warheads and missiles were removed by 98, I believe. I think you're right. Yeah, that sounded, 98 sounds right with that, so they brought all those, uh, the missile squadrons offline uh, and, and had all the missiles cleared out by, by 98. Uh, so, 94 converts to uh, air refueling wing. We just have the case 135 bars there. Uh, KC 135Rs depart in December of 2010, and uh, we went to being an air base wing. And we, uh, we ended up getting assets from the uh, uh, 9th Reconnaissance Wing, the 69th Reconnaissance Group, bringing up uh, their RQ 4 Global Hawks uh, and some other custom board patrol missions uh, with MQ 9. So that's, you know, going a little deeper in there, but gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> well, let's get Will on this conversation. So during this time, uh, what were the Soviets doing? Uh, when did they first get their ICBMs? And what were their capabilities around the time that Grand Forks Air Force Base became operational? Yeah, so I, I would say uh, the base of the Grand Forks really opened up probably one of the most exciting periods, about 12 to 24 months uh, in the Cold War, outside of maybe the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I, I think um, that's for a couple of reasons, right? I mean, you have um, Sputnik being launched that year, right? Um, in addition to Sputnik being launched, you have, uh, within that same period of 12 months, uh, Khrushchev saying, we will bury you to the Western diplomats, right? You have that on top of that. Um, you have the Soviets coming out with the, uh, the R-5, right? it's their medium-range uh, ballistic missile there, which is the first one with the nuclear chip on it. Right after that, you've got the R-7 coming out. Um, so basically, you're at this point where the base being set up here um, was at the point where the Soviets are actually taking maybe an early lead on ICBMs and ballistic missiles in general before we caught up. I think it was like, what, two, three years that we were behind them between yeah. the release of our or the replacing of operations. Like, yeah, the Atlas, basically. Yeah, yeah Atlas. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we kind of answered this with the talk about fighter interceptors and um, bombers, but what was the primary role of Grand Forks Air Force Base? Well, initially, uh, it was, you know, it served as a fighter interceptor, um, you know, to give that intercept capability there in the northern tier for Soviet aircraft, you know, coming in through Alaska, down through Canada, or up to the poles, down through Canada. Um, you know, so uh, that was a big part of it. And then, as we start looking at the, you know, nuclear arms race kind of stuff, where we have the, you know, everything's posturing, everything's, uh, uh, you know, mad, <laughs> as your cartoon you showed us earlier. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, a mutual assured destruction, which is the, the uh, motto of the Cold War for 50 years. Uh, and then, so we start bringing in the B-52s, that gives us that nuclear reach capability uh, to be able to do retaliatory strikes, responding to sort of uh, you know, nuclear strikes that came in. And then obviously the KC-135s to be able to support that. Uh, and, and as I recently found out, we uh, we actually supported uh, Chrome Dome operations uh, with, with KC-135 refuelers, which I, I did not know that. Everything that I looked through and been reading and researching for this, uh, that 
I have to say, I'm more of a World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and then my own wartime participation uh, kind of guy. So, so delving into a lot of the Cold War, uh, you know, uh, stuff is uh, uh, probably a little more catching up I need to do. But you know, if I'm to be honest, uh, uh, but yeah. So uh, yeah, that, you're supporting Chrome Dome with Fuelers. We're supporting the the nuclear response. Uh, you know, and, and that was that was primary thing, and then, and then the strategic missile wing comes in, uh, and you know, yeah, that's kind of it, it. Was basically all about being part of the nuclear triad. So. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so, Cal, what was life like um, in the launch control facilities, both above ground and below ground? What did you have to do to stay busy? We didn't have to worry about staying busy. SAP did that for us. Um, when I first went to Grand Forks in uh, 1978, we were pull pulling 24-hour tours down in the, in the launch control center and then come up. Uh, my last two years, we pulled 48s. So we went down and came out two days later, uh, two, uh, two officers uh, with... Uh, 38s on your side and with a, a full capability to monitor, maintain, and, and launch the missiles. Uh, and you're down there for 48 hours at a time. And there's always maintenance going on on the, the missiles. Uh, and so we had to be down there monitoring the connectivity and monitoring all the security, monitoring the maintenance. Uh, where everything was going on. And uh, in the evenings, once the teams went back to base, uh, one officer could sleep at a time in a little enclosure we had back there with a mattress and a big rubber surround something. something. And, but we always had to be available in case there was an EA emergency action message. And they came about every five minutes. <laughs> And there's always testing, always something going on. Uh, so you didn't get much rest while you were down there. And you were uh, fairly eager to go back home to your, your, your wife and kids, uh, wherever the base, how far you were from the base. So uh, there was maintenance, it was a mad time. And one of the things that the uh, Air Force did for us, silo jockeys downstairs, is what they call the Minuteman Education Program. And if you were to come up to the Northern Tier bases and go into missile silos, do a four-year control tour, they would pay for a master's degree for you. And uh, you and me participated with that. You could either get an MBA or an uh, MPA, Master of Public Administration. And so you your downtime, whatever you had in down there, you were studying. And so I got my MBA while I was down there from you and me on top of my two MBC degrees. That is really interesting. Um, so I have to ask, um, while you're down there, I assume you mentioned you're very busy. Um, you didn't really have that much time to make small chat or small talk with the fellow officer that you were stationed down there with? Oh, yeah. You were working side by side with them and and you got to know them very well, especially driving out from the Air Force Base. And you guys stories for that if you want to hear them. But, um, you got so, time. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up on these gravel roads in North Dakota. I couldn't drive less than 60. Um, and the military speed limit was 30. <laughs> they didn't let me drive very often. <laughs> so anyway, you got to know people very well. So I have to ask. Um, was there a contingency plan for missileers below ground? You know, in the worst case scenario, the keys had been turned, the buttons had been pushed, missiles were on their way, and missiles had been sent off. Did you have a plan for what you were going to do? Bend over and kiss it. <laughs> yeah, there was an emergency uh, uh, hatch that's filled with sand that you could, after the appropriate time, uh, get yourself out and uh, if you were still alive and, and you weren't radioactive and stuff, uh, there was a plan that uh, 
we would meet at the Cooperstown uh, uh, Park, that anybody that's still alive and functioning uh, to get back together and provide a military response. But realistically, um, when I went down to Vandenberg Air Force Base for training in 1978, the first day of training, they put you through uh, an experience of what you'd be doing and what the weapon system that you were working with and what its capability was and kind of what to expect if we had a war. And with the mega tonnage that we knew was targeted on Grand Forks and Minot, if it were all hit, which it wouldn't hit, because they had such lousy uh, uh, guidance systems. If they targeted Grand Forks, they'd probably hit far away. <laughs> but if they all did hit uh, Grand Forks, the two craters would meet at Devil's Lake. That's how much in the war zone we were. So there wasn't much hope that if we ever got into a shooting match, that there'd be anything to crawl out for. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so this is both for uh, both Jason and Cal. Um, so how large was the missile field cannon around both Grand Forks and Mine? Can I take that? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. The 321st uh, missile wing was comprised of three squadrons, the uh, 446, 447, 448. And the 446, okay, back me up here. Each squadron had 15, uh, pardon, 15 launch control centers. And each launch control center had connectivity through uh, wires and cables and everything to 10 nuclear missiles. So each of those squadrons had 150 missiles all dispersed, you know, roughly um, equidistance. But the 446 started at the Canadian border and it came down. And then the, the 447 started just north of Highway 2 and went down. And the 448 oh, started off Cooperstown and went down to I-94. And it went down to Valley City. The other thing that to remember is that we're talking history here for Grand Forks. There still are 150 nuclear missiles in North Dakota managed by Minot. And they are uh, as potent and as operational as they ever have been. Yeah, no, that's pretty much spot on. Uh, <laughs> my notes that I made, you know, basically is. Uh, it's stretching as far north uh, to uh, uh, Mount Carmel, I think just outside of Mount Carmel. Uh, far west is uh, Starkwater, south of Tower City. It's for the, about for the south of the region. There's about, what, 45, 50 miles between the first missile silos and then Grand Forks Air Force Base. Again, I, I guess the thought was that maybe it'd provide some level of standoff by having it that far away. I don't know. Um, <laughs> when you're talking about the <laughs> Close on the counts of horseshoes, hand grenades, and nuclear weapons. <laughs> you mentioned Starkweather. Mm. Uh, my wife is from Starkweather. And a little offside story here, but when I was at Vandenberg training, we had a week's you know, delay in our training. And my wife was going student teaching at uh, Devil's Lake and living at home yet with her parents at Starkweather. And so I come back up here with my TO and the training materials and stuff to study while I came up for a week's vacation with them. And so I pull up my, my TO, my tech order, with my father-in-law, who was 100% Norwegian. And uh, I show him the diagram, pull off page, the diagram of the 60-foot missile and 120-foot silo. And I point out the, uh, the three multiple retardable warheads. And he looks at it and looks at me and says, you mean there's nuclear bombs on that thing? <laughs> there was a, a mile and a half from his house. <laughs> oh, God. Did, never realized it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was, that was probably a really interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Sudden realization that, oh man, it's, a, it's heavy stuff. Absolutely. Uh, so, Will, um, if it existed, what was about the closest Soviet equivalent to Command Force Air Force Base? So, I was kind of thinking about that one this week. So, I think there's probably not a perfect one to one analogy there. Um, but there were a couple that I made notes on here that I think could be kind of relevant here. So it, you know, two of those that were kind of on their northern border, right? You've got um, Talagi and Sabatia, uh, where they had kind of these uh, long-range interceptors that they built out. And I, I think these are especially interesting, but it was the Tu-28, the, the Tupelo-28 that they were flying there. Um, basically the heaviest fighter jet ever built. Um, it was, you know, triple the weight of the MiG-21. It had triple the fuel capacity. And, and part of that was they had this incredibly long northern border. Um, they didn't have the resources to guard all of it. And they decided they were going to make the absolute heaviest you know, plane possible. It was never going to be in a dogfight. It was never going to be maneuverable. It had terrible visibility. Um, it could fly a really long ways and hold more fuel than anyone else. Um, and, you know, they, they placed those in strategic locations. And, and those two bases, I think, would be two of them. Um, I, I think from a strategic bomber perspective, um, probably uh, Ukrainka would be one. I mean, it was further out east, um, so it wasn't necessarily on the northern border. Um, but that, kind of having that, um, that strategic bomber element might also have been relevant. I think what's interesting though is if you look at the map of the former Soviet Union and the case back there, you know, you'll see that almost all of those major ICBM sites and infrastructure is on one half of the country. Um, and half of it looks completely barren like there's nothing there. It was kind of this mentality of you know, protect Moscow at all costs and everything's expendable except Moscow. Um, and so you end up with concentric rings of defense around Moscow, including you know, satellite states and uh, you know, capabilities they put in Latvia and Lithuania and uh, Ukraine. Gotcha. Uh, so as many of you, actually probably all of you saw in our parking lot, we have a Minuteman 2 ICBM on display. Um, you don't have to worry, it's completely demilitarized. Um, so what was, I guess, let's compare and contrast between a Minuteman 2 versus whatever the Russian or Soviet equivalent was. If Cal, if you'd like to chime in, please. I'm not familiar with the Soviet counterparts, but I will contrast with the Minuteman II and the Minuteman III, which came in in 1973. Now, Minuteman II, they're both almost 60 uh, feet long. Minuteman II had one nuclear warhead. When the Minuteman III's came in, they had three warheads uh, under the shroud, and with the, the uh, Capabilities that we got in the CDB came in uh, about 1977 or so. That we could retarget those uh, bombs, those uh, reentry vehicles, uh, from our launch control centers. So that the missile maintenance people didn't have to go out there at 40 below zero weather and uh, go out and, and retarget them in the silo. Uh, so we, once they lift off, you can't change them anymore. They're going where they're going. But if uh, National Command Authority decided that they wanted this one to go to Leningrad instead of Moscow, uh, we could do that from our launch control centers. So the retargeting and the multiple uh, warheads, but then again, uh, after I left, uh, with the arms reduction talks, uh, they did take the Miniman 3s from three warheads down to one again. So, take it away. And, and so, you know, the Soviets have kind of an interesting approach here um, with the R-36, because, you know, like you mentioned before, their, their accuracy was not as good as the U.S. ones. They didn't necessarily have that ability to, to maneuver them independently. Uh, their solution was just to pack 10 nukes onto one of them. Um, and it basically was like a cluster bomb of nukes. Um, and, and so even if they couldn't precisely hit one city, if you hit a city with 10 nukes, you're, you're probably going to get it. Um, and, and that was basically their, their approach there at that point in time. At the, at the height of the Cold War, uh, the U.S. had approximately uh, 20,000 uh, nuclear weapons. Soviets had 30,000 because they didn't have the accuracy, so we let them have uh, a lot more tonnage and a lot more numbers. Uh, at the height, okay, I'll, one more thing. 
something to think about when we look at the Cold War. The bomb that hit Hiroshima had the equivalent TNT of 14,000 tons of TNT. At the height of the Cold War, if you take all the nuclear bombs in the world, we had 70 billion tons. If all of those went off at one time, what would happen to our global experience? Now, we're lucky enough now that we've gone down from 20,000 bombs down to less than 1,000. But we still have lots of them out in the world. I would say also just on the Soviet side, um, even if one of those went off, you know, with, with some of the ones they started building there, like Sarabombo, which is basically like the Tsar bomb, the, the biggest one that was ever detonated, um, that was a couple thousand times stronger than what was dropped on Hiroshima. I was going to say, wasn't there a second model they did that was even bigger than that? I can't remember what the kiloton rating on that was, but it was significantly more powerful than the first Tsar bomb. Yeah, in, in, um, in the case in the back, in the top right back there, you'll see this clear fallout map um, that I brought in. We overlaid there over a map of North Dakota. Um, and, you know, if, if you were to do Zarbama, it wouldn't even fit on that. It, it's that much like Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so this one is kind of for all you guys. Um, Cal, I know you mentioned uh, SAC uh, earlier. Uh, for the younger people in the crowd, would you mind talking a little bit about Strategic Air Command and their role there? Come on, you sad trade killer, I know you know this. Well, I know my experience. And SAC, you guys can have to correct me, but I think, wasn't it Curtis LeMay that uh, invented SAC? Uh, after World War II, after the bomb was dropped, after the Russians got the bomb, it, everything was looked at, at from a battlefield perspective. How can we win this battle? And there had to be a, a change in attitude into strategic thinking. You know, a lot of it was, okay, how can we stop them from starting a war? And that permeated throughout our whole military, but especially the Air Force. And so we looked at, okay, we talked about mutually assured destruction. That's, I had a little cartoon here a little bit ago, and basically, and the two caricatures Two, two individuals uh, laying, looking at each other under a guillotine with a hand from one over on the other guillotine and their hand on ours, eyeballing each other. And that's how we stopped going to nuclear war for 50 years. Everybody knowing that we, if they dropped a bomb, say in Ukraine, that it would start nuclear annihilation back and forth and it would not stop and everybody would be annihilated and that's mutual sure destruction and strategic air command was the part that was the command within the air force that uh, uh, the nukes belonged to and looked at that type of thinking and allowed the rest of the air force to look at battlefield and, and uh, that tactical kind of thinking. I, I think also on the, the Soviet side, it's, it's interesting because um, <coughs> instead of strategic air command, you actually get these separate entities within the Soviet military. You know, you, you have the strategic rocket forces that control those ICBMs, but then what's interesting is that um, their air defense forces is actually a totally separate branch of the military. So, so instead of having this one unified entity, which is what you'd expect, right? Both, you know, kind of your, your defense and offense in one place. They actually separated those out, um, and that was even separate from their Air Force, um, and, and that was true for a long time. They, they kind of did a reorganization in the '90s, then again in about 2015, um, to create their equivalent of the Space Force. Um, but it was interesting how they separated and compartmented those in, in a way that you wouldn't really expect. I can give you the textbook answer if you like. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. Um, so kind of stepping back a little bit to uh, the days of the interceptors at Grand Force Air Force Base, um, what role, if any, did um, the semi-automatic ground environment or SAGE play up there? Oh uh, yeah, SAGE, uh, the old blockhouse. They, they, they demolished that actually in uh, 2008, I 
think it's something to learn now. Uh, so, so long and short of it, Sage basically tied in information from multiple radar sites and, and, and uh, you know, warning systems and took that information and, and through a series of massive computers in which they had a dual redundancy. So you, you had basically the inner workings were split into two halves, right? You had on one side you had A, on the other side you had B, and you could shut one down and flip the other one on to keep it going so you constantly had the system going while they pulled maintenance and repair on the other side. Um, but basically, it tied everything together and it, it gave a broad view image of the airspace over a large area. And then that could tie into any of the, uh, you know, the launch control facilities, pass information to that stuff. If there's something coming in, fighter interceptor squadrons, hey, you know, we've got, you know, aircraft coming in. Uh, if there was a uh, the name of the missile system it was actually it was actually an army program uh, was tied into it. Uh, I'm trying to think of the missile. It's a is it the Nike? No, 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 no. It wasn't Nike. Uh, hmm? What? <laughs> no, it was. Uh, it, it wasn't Nike. Uh, of course, my brain's going to vapor lock on this. Sprint. Uh, Sprint. Thank you. Jeez, old Mary. Gonna come up here and join us? Yeah. Why not? I mean, you come here after work. It's, it's just wrong. Um, yeah. So it was all all tied into the Spartan and Sprint missile systems, which would, was an anti-ballistic missile system, uh, or an early one. And uh, actually, I think two years ago there was a, a, a Sprint site. I want to say north and northwest of here that was up for sale. Um, I actually thought of it by. The did you? You saw the ads. It's really tempted, yeah. Well, if you saw the pictures, right? Or you, you, you wouldn't, yeah. No. Everybody thinks it'd be cool to own like a missile silo or something like that. Yeah. A lot of his missiles. Yeah, well, yeah. And then rust, flood damage. Um, God only knows what else. It's, you know. But, uh, but yeah, basically it allow, it, it, it give you an, an image of what's up there over a broad area and, and you can send up an appropriate response. Um, you know, and, and that's, Basically, what it did from uh, gosh, fifty something, sixty. I have it in a notice. Swear to God. Yeah, uh, it was from the fifties to the eighties. Sage was active. So uh, yeah, that, that's what it was. And, and we, uh, I think, Nakoma, the pyramid, that was tied into it. Even though it was, what was it, a hundred percent active for like all of seventy-two hours, and then they realized. Somebody got the utilities bill and decided that was probably a bad idea. And, uh, and it was on a, a reduced capability uh, operational stance. And it was run by the Army. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, look. I, I get it. I get it. Dumb Army mule. I get it. I get it. Don't worry. I'll get my shots in later. It's okay. Yes, sir. You're talking about anti-ballistic missile systems. Mm. If a ballistic missile is intercepted by one of these things, does the strike of the, of the missile disengage the detonation system on the, on the uh, inbound, or will it go off? So if I, if I heard you right, uh, you want to know that if uh, any ballistic missile system hit an incoming ICBM, would it disable the, the missile as well as the, most, most specifically the payload and prevent detonation? Right. Uh, you know what? I, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, if you could then disable the whole missile and disintegrate it, then they were nuclear tipped. Right. So either way, you're going to have some sort of fallout. It, it was, it was uh, a nuclear explosion is going to uh, either take that missile out, destroy it, or disrupt its guidance system. So the anti-ballistic missile has a nuclear warhead as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the army came out with that. Sorry. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's a lot we get right. There's a lot we get wrong. I'm willing to take the hits for it. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So.
basically that's what would happen. Are there any other questions on that one? Or? Well, yeah, we'll answer, we'll open it up to the audience at the end of the questions up here. Yeah, no, that, was a, that was an awesome yeah, question. Thank you for bringing that up. You should say that. So, Cal, I, I have another question for you. Um, I am uh, also an MSU grad myself, and I have a lot of friends who are farmers or sons of farmers from rural North Dakota. Um, and one of my friends mentioned, you know, long before he came to the world, um, his father was combining during the harvest season and struck a cable. Um, was this something that happened pretty regularly, or was he just lying to me? Um, uh, do you have any examples of that? He was not lying to you. Um, when the contractors put in the connectivity from the launch control centers to the missile silos, the uh, cables were supposed to be at least six feet deep to get below the, the frost line. And they put them in real fast and a lot of them didn't. Okay, and so with our frost upheaval up here, you know that the frost, you know, the ground goes up and down. And quite routinely, uh, we would cut cables uh, when our, with our farming. When that happened, and we no longer could uh, connect with the launch control centers, then we would have to send out security teams in a camper. And they would have to babysit that site until maintenance could repair the cable, find it, the place it was uh, disconnected, and then uh, reconnect it. And talking about security, another one of the issues we had is in the launch control center, we had a row of lights uh, for each missile and all the different parameters uh, that we had to monitor there. The lights that came on most often were the inner zone security light and the outer zone security light. Inner zone security light is any disruption subterranean on that the uh, is within the perimeter of the uh, missile uh, ground inside the fence. Gopher digging a hole would set off that inner zone security. The security people would have to go out there and babysit that site until it reset. Often it didn't reset. And they would have to sit in that camper looking at that uh, uh, cyclone fence to make sure that nothing happened to it. The other one is the outer zone security fence, uh, sensors I mean, which are up on poles. Uh, along the fence. Birds fly through that security sensors, especially when sunflowers started getting planted up there. <laughs> and those security uh, teams would have to sit there and babysit that missile. But when sunflowers really got big up there, we didn't have enough security people. <laughs> But those are some of the interactions uh, with farming and uh, nuclear weapons. Interesting. Well, that, that actually, that, that cave, the, the network is kind of interesting because it's a hardened intersite cable system. And what I thought was kind of neat about it is the fact that the whole cable system is pressurized pneumatically. And so if there's a drop in one PSI or more, it automatically trips anything. And so, you know, even though it's so robust, and they designed it that way, obviously, for survivability, you know, if you can't get below the plow line just due to frost upheaval and things like that, you get those nicks, that's pretty neat. I think people have a pneumatic sensor like that, just to going out for, I mean, thousands and thousands of feet of cable, you know, network slider web between, you know, the, the various actual silos from the math. Uh, I thought that was a really cool system when I was reading on it. Another case for no-till farming. <laughs> <laughs> so, Will, uh, following the end of the Cold War, uh, I guess how many Russian advisors, or I guess was there a specific term for the, the advisors, I guess maybe, that came and oversaw the destruction of these missile silos, or the you know, removal of the ICBMs? 
Uh, so, you mean um, inspections here in the U.S.? Or yes, correct. Or, or, or I guess either or. Um, I, I would say um, for a lot of the infrastructure that was in the former Soviet Union, um, it was a little bit chaotic, right? Because I mean, all of a sudden it's different countries now. Uh, a lot of stuff was unguarded, and people aren't being paid. They don't feel like guarding things anymore. Um, and so, you know, a certain amount of military hardware walked off. Um, you ended up with arms dealers taking over. A lot of it, you know, you look at Victor Boot, um, who oh, the yeah. Foreign War is about. Um, you know, he ended up with a pretty large chunk of, of arsenal there. Um, about a third of it was sitting in Ukraine. Um, and the Ukrainians eventually uh, destroyed that. And obviously now, you know, this year there's been a lot of debate about if it was a good idea for them to, to disarm, um, given that was done with the promise of, um, of help if the Russians ever invaded. And so, you know, you end up with each individual former Soviet state kind of making their own decisions here about what they're going to do with that hardware. Um, and then I know on the U.S. side, you also had some, uh, some knowledge of visits to the Air, Air Force Base. Yeah, we did have visits uh, during all the Star Treaty stuff. Um, I, I can't give you specs on how large the Russian teams were and whatnot, but I do know floating around in, in, in my archives, I've got photos of, of the Russians coming out and meeting with our people. Um, so yeah, that, that, you know, that was actively going on. I mean, not just here, but across the country on those sites. Uh, what was it? In the clear sky or uh, where, you know, basically they could do overflights of uh, the various areas. And, you know, monitor things that way, as well as sending the teams out. Uh, you know, so you had boots on ground doing inspections. But you know, one of the other things that came under the Star Treaty was so. You know, if you're familiar, we've got that that B-52, we've got that AGM-28 uh, Hound Dog, and then we've got the okay. Well, actually, we we, we don't have the Minuteman currently sitting up. But we're working on that. For those of you who are concerned about that, we're trying to square that away and get the missile back up. Uh, <laughs> many conversations with the head of the Missile Air Association uh, about that. So, um, but if we if we want to relocate those items because they were nuclear capable uh, pieces of equipment, we have to inform the various organizations that oh hey we need to move our B fifty two from this particular parking spot where we stuck it outside the gate to another one for whatever reason or we're breaking it down to, to you know major restorations. We have to we have to inform them that we're actually moving them because everything is so precisely counted, you know, accounted for and monitored. Uh, so you get a Soviet satellite or something goes well, okay, I say Soviet, but Russian satellite rolls over, you know, this neck of the woods and sees, oh hey, we're Where'd that B-52 go? What's going on there? We're going to get a phone call. And they're going to start asking questions. So, yeah, it's uh, it's still stuff we're even dealing with today, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all that. And I, I think the topic of accountability for materials also gets interesting because, you know, even, okay, things like smoke detectors, right? You know, a smoke detector in the U.S. uses Amory CM-241. Uh, the Soviets actually had smoke detectors that had plutonium instead. And so there are abandoned buildings in the former Soviet Union that have uncontrolled plutonium sitting inside smoke detectors. <laughs> um, the Soviets also experimented with uh, nuclear-powered lighthouses because they worked really well in cold areas um, and you didn't really have to do maintenance if you could leave a lighthouse there for a long time. But those were uh, radioisotope thermal generators, RTGs, were also powered by plutonium and they kind of just got left there. Um, so there are little bits of plutonium all over the former Soviet Union that no one's really watching. Um, and that, you know, from an accountability <laughs> perspective, it's kind of concerning. Right, yeah, yeah. Somebody needs to go in there with an Excel spreadsheet or whatever checklist they got to do some, some bookkeeping. That's scary. <laughs> when I separated from the Air Force in 82, my last deputy, his name is Jack Crum, and he's the one that's got me into this tonight. But uh, he's now retired and living in Pennsylvania. But uh, after he separated from the Air Force, uh, it was right during that time period and so he went over to Russia and became one of our inspectors over there. And he said, lots of vodka flowed. <laughs> I can believe that. Uh, so now we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions out there. Uh, we got one up the front. My question is for Will and Cal. Uh, first, Will, in general, what do you know about the clandestine operations that the Soviets were doing in this area, in general? And then, Cal, did you and your team ever encounter that? How much did you have to talk about be on guard for the pretty girl at the bar that wants you to tell all the secrets? Uh, what, do you, what do each of you know about that back then? 
on Econ on Trend. So that, that was a classic tactic, and, and you know, we used to brief people, if, if you're a five in America and a ten in Moscow, something was wrong. <laughs> And so that, I mean, honeypot operation, that, that was a real thing that they would try and do, right? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, when it comes to operations, I, I don't know specifically of operations in this area, but, um, I mean, they, they were all over from the start, right? Even if you go back to the Manhattan Project, right? Um, they were, they deeply penetrated the Manhattan Project from day one, which is why they got the bomb so quickly after us. Um, so I, it would not surprise me at all if they were looking at this area and running around. Um, but you might have anecdotes that I don't in about, uh, oh, about 1980, we were informed that there's one bar downtown that we were no longer allowed to frequent uh, for that reason. Uh, so, and that's the extent of anything I know. We just lived our lives uh, normally. You know, we didn't worry about those kinds of things. We knew people would take care of us, they'd prevent those kinds of things. But after I separated, I went to work for a company down in Aberdeen and but hmm, probably two, three months after I separated, um, we were walking through the mall, the little mall we had down there at the time, uh, my wife, my little daughter, myself, and this fellow comes up to me really out of place in a, in a cream colored cashmere long coat uh, and started talking to me about missiles, started talking to me about Grand Forks. And so I, and I tail it out of there and pulled out the squadron and reported it. But I don't know whatever happened to it, but he was completely out of place. Question is for Cal. So if you had gotten the order to launch in your heart of hearts, would you have sent that missile up? That's a tough one. It's not tough at all. In a second. In a second. Let me explain. Every two weeks, they would put you in a computer simulator of a launch control center and spend four hours doing nothing but simulated launch and emergency procedures. And you've done that time and time and time and time again. And by the time that we actually closed to, did doing that once, there wasn't a single person who wasn't sad, I mean, just salivating like Pavlov's dog, you know, wanting to do what they were trained to do. And we were, we were five seconds from the launch order at one time. And after I left the military and there, I woke up in the middle of the night about six months afterwards with a cold sweat in the middle of the night saying, what the hell did we almost do? And there have been several times we've gotten that close in the last 50 years. And there's no doubt in my mind that everybody would have absolutely done it. And then what did we, what did we do afterwards? Did you have a no long zone policy? Okay. Um, you talk a no long zone policy uh, in the launch control centers or on base or anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. Warhead. For warhead. Okay. Uh, in the launch control center. Okay. Any place that is sensitive, there was a SAC two-man policy. The two individuals enlisted or officers, you know, had to be present at all times. Okay. Now, in the launch control center, uh, we had to have two officers, two launch control officers there all time. Now, like I said, one could be sleeping in the middle of the night as long as he was there, and the uh, door was pumped shut. But anytime it was open, both had to be there with the 38s on, on the side. I'm going to give you a, a little bit more detail than you do on that question. Okay. The launch, has everybody seen the, uh, the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick? 
Okay. Other than the top side building, which looks like an old farmhouse, the thing is absolutely accurate. You could have taken the downstairs um, and made it, you would have been down to the 447th Squadron in Grand Forks Air Base with the red ascots and the blue uniforms, the 38s on the side and everything. That was our mock-up of our launch control centers. You know, it's 60 feet down, 40 feet from the roof to go back up to the, to the prairies. But that was what, where we lived. The thing was probably about, I don't know, 100, 100 feet long and probably 50 feet wide. And it's solid air, condition, uh, air conditioner in the center with computer banks around the outsides. And, and the, if you had sinus problems, you didn't down there because it was 0% humidity. Because they were cooling the, air, the computer banks down there and you were living in the middle of it. Every launch facility was in our own zone when the A circuit was open and the B drive was down. If, if the silo was open, it was a no loan zone. Don't go get, ahead. Follow the rules. Wait, wait. You were wait, wait for the mic. Give him the mic. Right here, yes. I was just going to say every launch facility where the missiles were at yeah. were no loan zones. If the A circuit was down, it was open up, and the B plug would drop, so there was access to the missile. If at any time anyone invited a no loan zone, they were going to get jacked up. And it was an honor and privilege to jack them. <laughs> so you know what I want. Al, uh, several decades, a few decades back, I was in South Dakota and there was a decommissioned uh, missile silo there, ICBM silo. And I was surprised uh, the targeting system that they had when that was uh, uh, built. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was a tube that ran diagonally up out of the silo that could be used for star sighting. And around the inside circumference of the silo was, I believe, a brass ring that had uh, uh, 360 degree marks on it. And they said that at that particular time, and I don't remember the era of the silo of the uh, missile, but uh, there was a gyroscope in the navigation system, and they basically were to basically point it and fire it, and uh, it was kind of like uh, a sophisticated rifle. And once it left the silo, uh, that was it. And I imagine some of the Russian systems were not very sophisticated in that era also. Could you talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the navigation systems as the uh, missiles uh, got uh, more technology? I can only uh, address what I experienced, okay, when I was down there. And I'm going to remind everybody that uh, when they get my uniform in the case back there next week, no one's been in that uniform for 40 years. So you're getting a point in time. Now, we never had anything like you're describing in the deuce capsules up here. Now, the deuce, the Minuteman II capsules, uh, launch control centers, stayed for the Minuteman III missiles. Now, they had to redo all the, the missiles and all the, the missile launch facilities to accommodate the Minuteman III missiles, but they didn't do anything different to the launch control centers. So we had a Minuteman II launch control center that operated Minuteman III missiles. So is this, what else did you ask? Just, uh, the oh, oh, the targeting. That's kind of interesting because uh, the Minuteman III missiles uh, were put in in 1973. And the guidance systems had the computing power of a um, IBM 8088 computer, which is like the first IBM computer. But they had the ability to fly halfway around the world and to hit within three blocks the Kremlin. We were that accurate on that primitive technology. And that's why we say, uh, I don't know what they've done since I was there. You probably improved an awful lot. You probably you hit uh, somebody's house if you wanted to, who knows?
would say one of, one of my experiences I was always interested in is uh, people did not realize how much firepower was out in the missile field. Uh, I, I don't know how many people know that we had machine guns, we had grenade launchers, M16s, and there were a lot of us out there. At Grand Forks, at the height, they had 1,000 security personnel. A thousand people just for the missiles, the weapon storage area on base, and the B-52s. And these and they, keepers. Yes, <laughs> and, and I, I, I remember Ford, Carter, and Reagan. Let's just say when Reagan won, there was a, a lot of applause throughout the base. But he, when he came in, we severely upgraded it to armored vehicles, much better equipment. We had old basically Vietnam War jump. The flak vest would just made you sweat. It wouldn't stop anything. And, and the potheads, you know, steel pot and stuff. But uh, I don't think people, I, I'll tell you this one story. And because you mentioned, when we got out, you talk about the security, uh, we signed nine non disclosure forms when we got out, what we were allowed to talk about and not talk about. So I could neither confirm that I there were ever nuclear weapons at Grand Forks Air Force Base. But I'll just say, theoretically, we were bringing back one time, and uh, an 18 wheel vehicle got too close to our security vehicle and would not get off our rear end. So he had a business and a machine gun for him. And he incredibly cooperated with me. He decided that he would drive slower until we left the floor. But no, I don't think people have any idea what's out there for just the, the security people, the firepower they have, and the ability to put a massive amount of people up there, like mine, if they needed to, in a hurry. Because they have a whole, the chopper, we could fly people out of something. And there was, I'll just say, there was a fire, people got hurt. Theoretically, nuclear weapons might take a wrong road on occasion. There was all lots of stories. That brings up another. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a question about potential targets of those 20 or the thousand of missiles that we have. Uh, like, web, like military, civilians, what, what kind of classes of targets the U.S. was looking at? Well, or is looking now? One, one, one thing you got to think about with, with, with nuclear weapons, it, it, it's, it's not the thing that has your name on it. It, it says to whom it may concern. It, it's an area effect weapon. So, you know, you're going to try to go for military targets, but if you have military target near a civilian area, yeah, anything that gets caught in the blast radius, it's all she wrote. So, I can't really pinpoint per se. Going back to the briefing that I was given my first day of training, Virtually no place in North Dakota would have survived. We were a big target. Yes, Grand Forks was. Minot was. Each of the launch control centers was. But even the Garrison Dam was targeted. If they hit the Garrison Dam, the water would rush down, take a uh, uh, Oahe Dam, and go down to Omaha and take out SAC headquarters, which was built on a floodplain. So I'm sure that Fargo with the guard and Bismarck with the guard, where the guards were, they were probably targeted too. So, like I said before, if we ever got into that skirmish, just bend over and kiss it goodbye. Don't hide under your desk. That's a funny thing, because I remember back when I was a child, the, the uh, uh, drills when you were in grade school, crawl under your desk. I mean, the mentality of that today is as scary as getting on a plane and back in the day and saying, do you want smoking or a non-smoking section? I mean, it, it makes no sense because it, it doesn't, in today's idea, it, it just, it was ludicrous. I mean, it, it, it didn't make any sense because it was a, a non moot scenario. 
Yeah, uh, I don't have anything specific on okay. targets yet, but go ahead. On both sides, on the east, uh, in, in the former Soviet bloc, in here, the biggest thing was keeping the populace calm. Yeah. Don't panic, live your lives. If something happens, worry about it then. But live your life. And how do you keep a population that's that scared calm? Give them something they think they can do for it. And we did. We survived. We lived through it all. We're all much better people for it. Well, I mean, we even did that in the, you know, in the military. I don't, I don't know what base training was like for you. And, and you CIA guys, I don't even know what's going on in Langley. But, uh, you know, I remember in basic training, you know, we're going through our whole, uh, you know, Seaburn phase of that, you know, um, donning Mop 4 gear, learning how to clear and seal gas masks and stuff like that, you know, and we get the lecture from the drill sergeant, and it's like, all right, so in the, the event of a, a, a nuclear attack, you uh, you lay face down with your with your K-pod, because we had the, you know, what came after the old M1Cs that you wore there, Terry, in the steel pods, uh, you know, K-pod came in, you just lay down, you face the boom, face the blast, and, and have your K-pod pointed towards the, and it's like, you know, anybody who's read anything, you're kind of like, seriously, what, this Kevlar is going to, what, stop that sedan that's being, you know, hurled through the air 120 miles an hour because of a shockwave? Okay. But, you know, you still did it, you still trained it, so it's ingrained, you know. But yeah, it's given something to do. That, that's, if you feel like you're out of control, you can't do anything, you panic, and it creates more problems. But, uh, did they tell you that when you were going through, and no, no, no face the boom, face the blast? <laughs> Just stay in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, if you, if you weren't in a foxhole, that was the, if, if you weren't in a foxhole, right. Now, the, the, the very nicely dug, uh, perfect 90 degree machine gun pit uh, with grenade stump that I dug would really, you know, do anything for me uh, in, in, in the event of a nuclear blast. But if I was caught outside, face the boom, face the blast, you yeah. would be good. <laughs> Good evening. Say, I'm just curious, 50 years ago there was a little bit of a time out, and so I'm curious from maybe the CIA perspective, so that uh, Air Force decided to fly 153 B-52s that otherwise could work in the United States to Southeast Asia and uh, take them off uh, alert for it was an unforeseeable amount of time in April of 72. Uh, what would the other side be thinking about that? So I, I know, at least in that Vietnam era, uh, there was actually a lot of Soviet activity that was going on down there. Um, and I mean, part of it was they were using their naval assets there to give information about the B-52s um, to, uh, to North Vietnam there. Um, so I mean, you know, they were constantly tipped off about what the B-52s were doing. Uh, the KGB was down there training them in signals intelligence as well. Um, so they were really heavily helping out there and they were running all over the place. Well, we are going to wrap it up here. We're going to move into our social hours. So if anyone has any other questions, um, I know our guests would love to stick around and talk for a little bit. There's one that we can get to. Um, let's give a round of applause to these guys. You're the, you're the one that's out there with all of that responsibility. That boggles my mind. I, I know I was at the Oscar Zero site and I've got down there. I took my kids down there. It's just for that. And, uh, you know, as kids nowadays have a perspective. And, uh, and I'm trying to get them to understand the concept of, of what you guys are sitting with down the path. is just, how do you explain that? You know, how do you, how, how do you explain to a kid the concept of, Mad, you know, the, what the world posture was at the time. So the, the fact that you, you carried that, and you have no idea how much respect I have for that. So thank you for that. I 
don't know how to uh, inform uh, this current generation about uh, the 50 years of Cold War that preceded you know, them being here. Uh, my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, when she was 10, she had an assignment to interview uh, someone who had been in the military about their experience. And I very enthusiastically did that with her. After about 15 seconds, she spaced out. No way could she comprehend, you know, a missile side. Could she comprehend a missile? Could she comprehend uh, a war that actually went on in our own environment like the Cold War did for 50 years? Uh, you asked a question, and I'm going to go talk way too much, I know, but in about, 19, about 2015, I caught wind that several states were working on uh, developing a uh, Cold War victory celebration from on May 1st, and they had seven states that are already uh, passed bills in their legislature to make May 1st a Cold War Victory Day. So I got with my state senator uh, in Bismarck, and I put that in his ear, and when he got around to it, he called me in to provide testimony for him. And and state of North Dakota passed it, but didn't do much with it. But I don't know how much information, how much knowledge there is out there right now about the Cold War. And so exhibits like this here, and the one that they're going to be building for a military museum on the Capitol grounds starting in two years, uh, these mean a lot. And I think that uh, uh, over time, hopefully, we can uh, get the information out to the next generations because as they say, you know, those of us who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah, yeah it's a conversation that I've had frequently when talking about conflicts. And today's generations, even our own military uh, in, in today's generations, in who, and, and I'll leave it a bit for me. Uh, the Cold War, as the Cold War, for me, is not something that triggers dopamine production in my brain. It doesn't flip the switches, right? Uh, I know it's important. I know it's critical. I know it was a crazy time, and, and like you said, just a hair's breadth away from you know global annihilation. Uh, uh, just because of the sensor tripping the wrong way, uh, uh, I forget his name, but the Russian, the Russian guy who said, "No, we're not launching these missiles." Uh, one of the things is is how I think how we take in information and process information. And if you want to look at it from uh, from a standpoint of that, and, and please excuse my, my vernacular, but the Cold War is not sexy. You look at World War II. There's a, a in, in the European theater, there, there's a certain level of, and when I say romance, I, I don't mean Fabio on a book cover, you know, kind of romance, but there's that, you're in Europe, you have the castles, there's a great crusade of, of freeing, you know, uh, from the, 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 you know, the, the tyranny of the Nazis and, and the fascists in Italy and stuff like that. Um, so it's kind of easier to wrap your head around Maybe it, it triggers more, you know, those switches in the brain that people can kind of somehow connect to, um, and, and, and you see, and you see a disconnect for like the Pacific Theater because that wasn't sexy, that wasn't romantic, that was guys stuck on an island for months and their clothes literally rotting off their bodies because they couldn't get a supply ship, in. and you know, but there's there's none of that action adventure kind of thing which it, it's sad because of how, how many crazy critical things took place during that period of the Cold War. And I mean, we're not even talking Vietnam, you know, we're not even talking, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Bay of Pigs and stuff like that, you know, just the traditional kind of Cold War thing. 
You know, there's so many different things that went on where you're a hair's breadth away from absolute annihilation. You don't even know. You know, you get the espionage stuff, that's kind of cool, but it's, it's, not, it's not that wow kind of thing that triggers the dopamine sections, you know, part of our brains. And so trying to get the information out, I think one of the concerns that I have, are people going to digest it? It's not been since I have matured more, gotten older, been to war a couple times myself, and then, you know, now coming and looking at things, going from an Army perspective to an Air Force perspective and learning that, that I've developed more of an appreciation and been able to more easily digest Cold War information into to a, you know, in, in, in a way that gets me to think about it more. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's going to be interesting trying to figure out how to get them to digest that information. I, I think it's interesting also the Cold War talk, because I, I think you kind of almost get hooked on it once you start getting into it. I, I think right, part of it is, it, yeah. it, it, it's almost the more that you learn, the more that you realize you don't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, I think part of that is if you look at what Winston Churchill said um, about trying to understand Russia and how difficult that is, right? He said that Russia is basically a, a riddle wrapped, in, a riddle wrapped in a, a mystery wrapped in an enigma, right. and that the only constant thread is Russian national interests. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's very true. It's, you know, the more you kind of dive into this riddle of you know what was Russia thinking or what was the Soviet Union doing, the more you realize you have no idea and you want to start looking at it more. Yeah, you just got to start peeling away things and you have no idea and you start looking at like. Hold on, wait, these guys were holed up in a hotel across from the embassy and using, you know, a laser to measure the vibrating frequencies of a light bulb inside the embassy and pick up what these guys were saying over there and you're classified. Wait, 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 hold on, rewind that, I need to see that again, you know. That's all the stuff that was going on, it's really fascinating, but, you know, uh, you've got to peel back the layers, you've got to start digging, and getting people to do that is, I think, it would be Interesting. Historians are going to have a real challenge with this time period. Where I'm coming from is, you're talking about World War II, and there were reporters embedded with the soldiers right. at, the, at the front. And so there was news, and there was reports, and there's information to get to the public. When we start talking about the Cold War, we're talking about secrecy. Mm -hmm. And there, even in my four years, there were things that would have made headlines if anybody would have known. Right. But they'll never know them. Yeah. Because of the secrecy, I suppose from both sides, mm -hmm. because of national security. And we have a CIA. <laughs> Yeah, about that. But I would say also that not only the secrecy too, but also the disinformation being layered on top of that. Oh, yeah. with, with the Russians kind of being masters of that historically, um, you, you know, it's, it's not only just the fact that they would cover things up or try and hide things or even cover up their own failures when things didn't go well for them. It's that there'd be disinformation layered on top of that. And so there are things that come out even today that you know you can learn about. The whole world. They weren't the only ones that had disinformation. Yeah. You know, we had. Every communication system in the U.S. military coming into our launch control centers. We had information of what's going on. We also had a little Sony TV set up in the corner to get the local news and weather. So we knew what was going on and what was being told to the population. You didn't want to know what was going on. It was easier to live your life not knowing. Oh yeah, no, it's, it, there's, especially in recent times, and I won't go down that rabbit hole, um, at least up here, it, there are things that have happened and continue to happen that if, it, and a lot of it's actually open source, you can go, you can go find it open source, but if you took the time and you read about it and you put the pieces together and you look at the world situation and everything's going on, you put a little effort into understanding these various adversaries. Uh, there's stuff in there when you start to think about it and you look at our own responses, it's one of those, great, I have just finished this book, I have just finished this whatever, I'm, I'm not going to be able to sleep comfortably for a week because I now know all of this stuff that's been going on right in front of my eyes. We probably have to wrap this up. 
Yes. But let me just say that <laughs> as Americans, we have to trust our government to do what's best for us. We do. Because fine, you can do whatever. But I'm saying that if we had to focus on everything that's going on in the world, we wouldn't sleep at night. And it's much easier to sleep at night knowing that somebody with competency is monitoring and taking care of those things for us. And if you don't have trust in, in the National Command Authority and in your government, then you can go ahead and have sleepless nights. Let's get one more round of applause for us. <laughs> Please uh, feel free to approach our speakers afterwards, uh, grab a couple more refreshments, and check out our uh, over on the prayer exhibit. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, we're mostly friendly. We don't bite. So, well, I don't. I don't know.